one of my favorite possessions. The Mark Frierson. Um, yeah, from 2004. Mark Frierson makes a lot of these uh, sideshow pieces, um, some of which are reproduction. I mean, this is made out of real duck, but uh, reproductions and carny gaffs. And then he makes things that are easy, buddy. I have dogs in the room. That's going to happen a lot, by the way. I'm dog sitting with a friend. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm dog sitting a friend's dog. And that dog doesn't know my neighbor's schedule. So every time someone goes by the door, she thinks it's a brand new day. Um, Mark Frierson also makes jackalopes, pickled punks, which are um, fake. It's like two-headed babies and they'll be in a jar. It's pickled, pickled punk for a kid. I bought this from... um, the, the magician on Night Court, his name was Harry Anderson. He just recently passed away for a brief moment in New Orleans. He lived in New Orleans for a brief moment, a few years. Um, and he opened a shop for an even briefer moment called Spade and Archer, which if you don't get that, I didn't either. He had to explain it to me. That's uh, Sam Spade from oh, uh, the Humphrey Bogart movies. Crap. Anyway, um, that was the name of the detective agency. Play it again, Sham which isn't in the movie, but you played it for her. Play it for me, Sam. Uh, so I bought this from him and a few other pieces. Uh, Harry Anderson was a, a magician, but he was also big into like sideshow carnival freak show stuff. My wife named it. My wife named this little guy uh, Starsky and Hutch, which also um, belies our age. Starsky and Hutch were a detective duo. She had Laurel and Hardy, Abbott and Costello. That's what Batman and Robin. That's what she was going for there. Sorry, with the glass on, all you can see is a reflection of my screen. You got to admit, though, they're cute freaks, Starsky and Hutch. They live just behind my computer on a shelf of other oddities, most of which are just like either custom made things from friends of mine. That's why I'm not showing them to you. They're not interesting. Some of the others are. That's, I think, the coolest one. I've got a skull that was made by uh, another friend of mine who just recently passed away. It's a, it's a downer of a live broadcast this week, uh, Mark, um, who made, took a medical skull and made it really, really cool. So what I wanted to do is a bit of freak show and tell live. Uh, I have the computer set up, and I get questions all the time from people that I'm not going to put in the show. Uh, for example, people recommend, they ask me to recommend different books, magazines, ways they can find out more about the Circus Side Show. That's not going to fit well in a, in a stage performance. <laughs> That'd be a very, and now Oprah's book club at the end of a freak show and tell. So I've got a pile of uh, uh, books here. I'm doing all this to promote, by the way, if you live anywhere near Chicago or Waukegan, Illinois, the next few Fridays, I want to be performing. Sorry, there's a dog now under my feet trying to dig through my hardwood floor. So if you hear that noise or see me just suddenly stare at my crotch, there's a tiny little dog and she's just decided she can dig through a floor. I'm going to let her try because I don't like to squash anyone's dream. That, that's not my place. Who am I to tell her she can't dig through a hardwood floor? I barely know this dog. It's my friend's dog. Uh, and uh, so what was I saying? Oh, sorry. So every Friday, if you're near Chicago, especially if you're near Chicago, go to freakshowandtell.com. There's all the information you need. If you're in Waukegan, you'll need to buy a ticket. But if you're in Chicago, you don't. All that information is on the website. You have no idea who the hell I am. I'm Tom from Freak Show and Tell. I think it says it in the corner right there. Uh, don't worry, I'm not famous. I'm a nobody. But I've got a, uh, a show that I think is really good where I eat fire, uh, play with uh, nails. I'll, I'll use razor blades, electricity, broken glass. It's an insane show, but it's a science-based show aiming for adults. And that's why I get so many uh, questions about book recommendations. Otherwise, it makes no sense, right? Why would you ask someone for book recommendations? Because I'm an amateur sideshow historian. I'm an amateur academic in general. I'm a nerd. I just like stuff. I like history. I like science. So I talk about it. This is well, one of the more recent books I've read, Chang and Ang by Darren Strauss. Now, this is not a recent book. So the good news is you can get on Amazon Kindle for a couple of bucks or used in the bookstore for a dollar uh, because it isn't a brand new book. Chang and Ang are the original Siamese twins. Uh, their names, I don't this, I forget this out of the book or out of another thing. Their original birth, they're, they're from Thailand, um, which was Siam at some point. I don't even think it was. I think it's just sort of racism makes them called Siamese twins because they moved to America where we didn't really care about what part of Asia you were from. You know, uh, the States. And I, I guess that's just generally uh, Western culture in general is not a big fan of Eastern culture for a long, long, long time. Um, 
their original names translated into left and right. Now, I don't remember what they were in Thai, but in Thai, their names were left and right. And when they moved to the States, they became Chang and Ang. Uh, mostly, I think, so think of that as westernizing their name enough so that someone like me can say it, but yet still sounding vaguely Asiatic, vaguely Thai. I don't think Chang and Ang actually mean anything in Thai. It's just like, you know, if your name is Ehrlich Weiss, maybe you change your name to Harry Houdini when you go into show business. If you're John Stuart Leibowitz, maybe you just become John Stewart. It's a tradition in show business for a long time. It's a heck of a tome. I don't know if I'd call it summer reading, uh, but it's not academic. It's a fun story about these two gentlemen who had um, rather remarkable lives. They were married. They had kids. They were attached until death. So there's your preview. That comes in about right there in the book. Um, I'm going to move through. Okay, so this is my collection of James Taylor's Shocked and Amazed magazine, which um, you can find James. You can find Shocked and Amazed on Facebook. These guys publish sporadically. Um, but they're coming out with a new like uh, anthology, I think, very soon. So find them. So Shocked and Amazed magazine. And this is this is just really fun. Here's an idea of the source material I work with, too. So James Taylor, still with us. This is James Taylor, Shocked and Amazed. And you can see it's almost like a, just a really done zine, really. But I mean, black and white photography. Sorry, I, I make a terrible weatherman. I can never figure which way to move. Um, good writing, though. And that is really the defining characteristic. Uh, there's not really a lot of, um, there's no Hunter S. Thompson of Sideshow. There's no, you know, oh, Matt Fraser, by the way. So you may recognize Matt from American Horror Story, but he was doing a one-man show. This is, I don't even know what year this is, 2002 maybe. Uh, he was doing a one-man show about Seal Boy, who was a performer in the 50s who had the same genetic birth disorder. Can we still say birth disorder? Is that politically correct? Uh, but it was as different in the unique way as Matt Fraser. And so he did a show called Seal Boy Freak. And so that's one of the ads for his show, really. It's a postcard I think he was uh, selling after the show. The reason I mentioned the writing is because normally the writing is just, oh, Tyler Fire. Oh, my God. These are people I haven't seen in years. He used to hold it down at um, Sideshows by the Seashore in Coney Island, Tyler Fire. He basically ran Sideshows by the Seashore for a while there. Um, usually you're working with very, very poor writing. It's usually someone like me who has no training at all in journalism who's at best a mediocre writer who has no idea where commas go. And usually just because I'm the one who'll do it, I love it so much that I start submitting and they start publishing me because they were zines back then. These were like blogs, unedited and really no one gave a crap. James Taylor came along and upped the game a bit. I mean, certainly the cover art is amazing. And not to get an idea, I mean, this is a pretty healthy issue too. It just interviews with people that will be, be my, my peers, really, other people in shows. Uh, there aren't a ton of really famous Sideshow performers. Jim Rose would be the only real like superstar of Sideshow, the enigma um, from the Jim Rose show. Uh, but that's about it. This is um, a variation on Dr. Corny, who was a legitimate, med oops, a legitimate medical doctor who did not work with two-headed babies. Uh, but this is, I I'm assuming, a, a mashup of the two, done by whoever Kathman is. What I love are the covers on Shocked and Amazed. And the articles are always black and white. And enough photography, because ours is a visual art form, so you get an idea, uh, you know, girl to gorilla, and you get an idea of the flash of the, the um, flash is what they call the things out, out in front. The advertisement is your flash. For me, it'll be banners and postcards and such, such. These are not the most expensive things in the world, but they are out of print, um, which was why you'll notice. So when I met James Taylor, it was very briefly, I was working in the Hall and Christ World of Wonders sideshow. Uh, James Taylor... In the brief time I was with Hall and Chris Circus Sideshow, James Taylor came through to see Ward Hall and see him, Christ. While he was there, he sold me these out of the trunk of his car. I bought two of each one because uh, not ever having been a comic book collector, but a bunch of my friends were. I bought one to bag and board. So that's in a acid-free, just a pouch, but I mean, there's a board behind it. And then, the, then I bought one for perusing and thumbing through. So I have two copies of a lot of these. And um, these are also uh, signed by, by James Taylor because he was sitting in the room when I bought them from him. Uh, you can find these on eBay. You can also find, I just also noticed, I don't know if Facebook will let me show this. I'm going to kind of, um, it's uh, full, full nudity is included. If you, you know, they don't, they don't censor on the page before that is the amazing Mr. Lifto. And I'll, I'll do it again, a censored version of, uh, of uh, Mr. Lifto's act. I guess I didn't censor the other page. There we go. Accidental lack of censorship. It is a fully a um, PG-13, I guess, version. 
of this sort of stuff. They're absolutely amazing. Um, if James Taylor can't sell you back copies, uh, you can come by my house and I'll let you thumb through uh, these and have a read. Uh, you can also find them on eBay. Last time I checked was a few years back, but, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, 18 to 20 bucks. And then the larger issue was 25 to $30, which isn't that much more expensive than they were. Like I said, these were zines. So they were boutique printing, small run printing, never super, super, super popular. So as a result, um, they were always kind of expensive. They're also full color. I can't, if you never grew up, if you're not as old as I am or older, you don't understand zine culture, how rare it was to have this kind of quality in what I'm referring to as a zine. I've got questions a few times. Hey, Victoria, thank you so much. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Right, yeah. Uh, okay. Backtrack, curious how I got into Sideshow. I've always been into Sideshow the way someone would be into their favorite TV show or into, I don't know, acting or into theater. So I don't remember ever not reading stuff like this, uh, finding things in the library, watching those Ripley's Believe It or Not. Or there was a show, something like Special People or something like that. It used to be on the air when I was a real little kid. That's incredible, might have been the name. Three hosts, they would bring on people. Sometimes they were just like, what we see on America's Got Talent now. Uh, a little girl who could juggle five balls or six knives or something. Other times they were... Um, demonstrations like they had this Russian guy. This is a common thing. And for some reason, just in Russia, they'll claim they can be magnetic and they can, they can stick things to their face and uh, spoons and cans. Carl Pilkington does a really good episode of an idiot abroad. If you want to type that into YouTube of the Russian magnet, um, it's obviously it's fake. It's a sideshow trick. It's been debunked a lot by James Randi, but they would have them on. That's incredible. I always sought those shows out. And so when I was 15 or 16, hanging around, I was drawn to the carnival in general because I romanticized it in my mind. So I wouldn't have been, I would have been okay being a ride jockey. I'd have been okay being the guy with no teeth and a face tattoo in 1987. Um, no sleeves on his Van Halen t-shirt, smoking a cigarette and yelling at kids to get on and off the roller coaster. That, that was a dream job when I was 11 years old. Yeah, we're talking a sick obsession with this stuff. When I got into working at a carnival as a summer job, I ended up in fire eating uh, and, and uh, glass walking and all the, the sideshow stuff. But I think that's because I could talk to audiences. It, I, say, I say this in the show too, <clears throat> that at 17, I discovered I had the gift of gab, not just being a talkative person. That's all in my family. My mother's the same way. My own grandfather was a rambling story guy like me. So it's a genetic disorder. I'm afraid I was born with it but I've leveraged it into something that I can do that made money. And I learned that on the carnival lot that if I'm talking to two or three people and I'm trying to sell you something, whether that's actually sell you buy this book or sell you my personality or sell you my show, you know what I mean? Like sell, you mean talk you into something. We should go see Deadpool too. And here's why, right? There's some anxiety. There's some pressure there. The only difference between, between me and the vast majority of human beings who say they have a fear of public speaking is that that little bit of pressure anxiety doesn't amp up with the number of people. So if I'm doing my one man show for three people, I'm very worried that they're not going to think I'm funny or that I'm going to forget my line or forget my story or get lost in the middle and wander off as I tend to do when I'm not scripted. I'm worried that you're not going to have a good time. That's all in my head, two or three people. If there's 150 people, I'm still worried the same level though. It doesn't scale. The most people I've ever talked to at once is about 35,000 people. I talked to them in three and four minute chunks in between bands at festivals for a while. It was no more pressure than if there were three people in that theater. That's the reason I can do public speaking. And I think, I think most people can't is because talking to one person you can do talking to 400 people becomes 400 times harder. It doesn't for me. So I got into Sideshow because I went to work on the carnival lot and someone else who was a talker <laughs> smelled it on me and said, why you, you, you are an extrovert. We didn't use that term back then. This is in 1.6 billion years ago in the early nineties. Uh, you, you smell like the kind of guy that could sell cars. Why don't you come up here? And let me show you how to, how to talk to this group specifically and sell this circus Sideshow. This is one of my most prized possessions. 
Because I got to, I always heard about Ward Hall and Seam Christ, which if you don't know, the Hall and Christ World of Wonders is one of the last touring circus sideshows in the world. Uh, there aren't a ton of them, and there aren't a ton that are old school. There are people like um, Scott McClelland out of Canada, who certainly does a Nouveau circus sideshow. And from what I can tell from the photos, I haven't seen it yet, but holy crap, is this sideshow good. He's an artist. The art is spot on. I'll try and put a link in the comments later. I'll try and pin Scott McClellan because you should definitely follow his Facebook page, especially if you live north of the border, our, our friends to the north. Um, check him out. Uh, there's a bunch in Australia. But these are guys that are maybe my age, maybe uh, young ladies who are even younger than I am uh, in their 30s. So we didn't grow up with it. Ward Hall and CM Christ grew up with it. They were one of the last when I was a kid, and they still are. And I talked earlier about how good James Taylor's writing is um, for Shocked and Amazed. He is Shakespeare compared to the bar. The bar is incredibly low. So I'm not saying James is good for Sideshow. James is good. He's a good writer. These are fine magazines. I put, put their writing up against anybody in the magazine game. But let's compare it to the norm, and you'll see how incredibly impressed I was. Again, it's autographed. To me, I'm, uh, yeah, this one's to me. I've got another one that's to me and Michael, who was my partner. I was in a show called The Modern Gypsies, which is now his show and has been for decades. He's, he's run that show forever and run it very well. I've got another one that's autographed to Tom and Mike. Um, this is Ward Hall and he wrote this, it's a pitch book. So it's just, you know, it, what's fun is I'll get to the middle in a second. So the text is, you know, clearly he's trying to pack in the pages by making the text big, the old trick he used in high school. Ward Hall took a liking to me because Ward started as a juggler and I started as a juggler. That was really my first act was I could juggle. I could do exactly this act, a different costume. Although if I'd had this costume, I would have wore this costume, um, juggling clubs. And that's a sword ladder. So you prove the swords are real, and then similar to Bed of Nails, you can then walk a ladder of fairly sharp swords. You just have to be careful. Don't slip, or the show ends prematurely. And then you juggle clubs. And then my big finale was I would jump off the sword ladder, which would scare people. But I've also seen people go under the leg. Um, let me get to the middle, and you'll see what I mean about the quality of some of these books I have. And again, if you're ever in the Chicago area and you want to pop over, um, and you can treat them delicately, I'll let you thumb through this collection. If, if you can't find this, I think Ward might still sell this. Oh, this isn't the one. Sorry, I've led you down the garden path. But there's also a blank page in between two photos, by the way. I don't know if that's a mistake. The book just has some random blank pages. A mistake or maybe a really carny way to pad the size of your book. Hey, aspiring authors for a National Novel Writing Month, uh, maybe just add blank pages. Maybe your 150-page novel turns into a 300-page novel. Hmm? Hmm? Yeah. I don't know how many returns you'll get on Amazon, but, you know, uh, this was – so the one I was thinking about is this other book. I'll just explain it, and you can find it. So these photos are nicely laid out in a professional manner. In the other book, he's taped the corners with scotch tape and then, I'm going to say mimeographed, but Xeroxed the page and then sent that off to the, the small publishing house to bind and print. So it is literally photos – taped to a piece of paper and then submitted which is sometimes the quality of this is prime material though this is this man's words now they're probably as accurate and inaccurate as anyone else's first person story i'm sure he's the hero in all of his tales he's left out a lot of stuff as we all would when writing a memoir no judgment no judgment ward i swear i'd lie more than you did i promise um you leave out a lot of the warts but first material at least i've got this, we've got this in the world. This isn't the only copy. So this exists in the world. Uh, Thomas St. Clair is asking, do I change my presentation style depending on the audience size? Yes, but I haven't done that in years. My audience size now is very consistent, um, meaning between 40 people and 300 people. And that's not a wide enough, that sounds like a big di difference. It really isn't. 40 people in a black box theater feels very similar to 200 people in a 300 seat theater. Uh, as far as the size of stage, the lighting, the projection, the mic or the lack of mic you would use, you change your presentation style when you're going from really one-on-one -on -one talking to someone like in an Apple store and you're really going back and forth or you're in the sideshow and only one person's in the tent at the moment because it's slow that day. And then the next month, 35,000 people. If you talk to stand-up comics are the ones who really have to rewrite their act when Robin Williams or Steve Martin gets so famous, they're filling stadiums when Chris Rock is selling out Madison Square Garden for the first time. So he's gone from a thousand seat theaters. I don't know what Madison Square Garden is. Let's say 10,000, maybe more than that. 
that's huge. So he has to slow down. You become like, you talk like a politician really, because you need them to catch your premise so you can hit your punchlines. I don't play that size anymore. And when I did, my only job really was to cover while they moved the drums real quick, breathe fire and make some dick jokes, jump up and down on broken glass and make some dick jokes. Uh, big, loud, dumb, by the tech group, the tech crew, about 90 to 140 seconds to switch things over. I could do up to four minutes, but really they need 90 to 120 seconds to just pull some stuff on and off stage. And then, ladies and gentlemen, the moment you've all been waiting for, give it up for, and you say the name of the band. So you're kind of emceeing. So my style would change based on that. Uh Someone says they've got a friend that does that act. They do the, the sword ladder. You'll have to, sorry, because it just says Facebook user for some of you. I guess, I don't know why that is. I've got some people's names and others that just Facebook user. Maybe my friends show up as friends and Facebook users just show up as Facebook users. Uh, I'm going to start doing these more often. Again, just because I own the technology and I've got some fun toys. Now I just moved. If you've ever seen me do it, well, you can kind of see my closet over here with just some clothes hanging and some stuff still wrapped in. That's, those are like plaques and awards and stuff that would normally hang on this wall right here. Haven't unpacked them yet. Um, so as I unpack more of my stuff, I had to go, I had to run around and find this guy today. I had to text my wife. I was, uh, this is my life too. You just text your wife. Hey, where's the two headed duck? That's just normal in our house. And uh, then, yeah, here we go. She goes, oh, it's in the red suitcase in your production closet. Oh, thanks, honey. That's just a normal day for us. Uh, as I find more stuff, I'll bring it out. I also brought up these books because I had questions from people. When I posted the thing about scheduling live, uh, there was a message button, and that message just goes to Freak Show and Tell's message me area. Um, so if you just click that button next time I post one for Q&A, type your question in there. And then I did some of the stuff on the right is fine if you're asking questions right now. But if you've got questions about, could we see how a bed of nails is constructed? Can we see corner joints on this? Do you have any uh, blah, blah, blah. Fire eating torches up close. I can hold, you know, right there as far as the focus goes, right? Um, just type that in a message. And then that gives me time to prepare because I got to dig through this closet currently. If you are in Chicago or Waukegan, Illinois, in the next five or six Fridays, go to freakshowandtell.com. If you're in Michigan, Pennsylvania, Ohio, oh, go from, from start in Chicago and drive over to Pennsylvania. That, if you're in that, uh, downstate New York, uh, almost in there, uh, make sure you're on my mailing list. I've had a problem with Facebook where I'll put up an event, I'll talk about it 20 times, no one saw it. And they wanted to come to the show. That's what breaks my heart. They go, I, I live in Pennsylvania. Where you were right an hour away. I could get on my mailing list, and that way you'll get, uh, you'll get, if I'm doing shows like every week, you'll get a thing explaining I'm doing a show because not everyone opens the first one, unfortunately. So you got to send like three every, but every week, I'm not sending four a day. Um, and then uh, you'll get tour. Hey, I'm going out on the road for this month. Here's the tour dates. Same thing you see on Facebook, on Twitter, maybe on Instagram. If I remember to post it to Instagram, sorry, Instagram, I forget about you. I'm above your demographic. I'm not a, I'm not a Instagram aged. Uh, I could fax them to your office if you'd like. Uh, Victoria asked, are my torches just sewn, no screws? Yes, but that's because I make them a dozen at a time. If you're making torches, the screws are there. Well, one, they can get hot, so you got to make sure you're conscious of which side they're on, or you will sear your tongue if you're doing long form. I barely eat fire in the show. I eat fire just enough to explain. When I was in the circus sideshow, you'd play a CD for four minutes, and you do every fire-eating trick you know for four minutes. The screws will get hot then. I'm using just mercerized cotton, Kevlar, Elmer's glue. The hotter it gets, the stronger it binds. That white Elmer's glue, I think now it's purple also. Doesn't matter. Same stuff. You glue them together. Also buy Kevlar that has a, a peel back adhesive and I also glue them. And then I just sew them. I make 10 to 15 at a time. Uh, takes a few hours once you really get the production rolling. And then not only do I switch them out on stage, I have four on stage. I use two at a time, two hands. I'm not holding four, you know, like that. Um, so I switch them out on stage, but I also just throw them in the garbage when they get a little bit of wear and tear. And then every year or so I make another dozen. My juggling torches have big old screws in them. And I've done fire eating with juggling torches. Uh, when I was a younger man, right? The juggling torch is about this big and ah, it's a little more challenging. Just watch out if you're using screws because now you're adding a danger element. 
uh, that you just need to be conscious of. Just be aware. Um, yeah, the Elmer's glue thing, I've heard I use Elmer's glue because it will burn non-toxic. It's no, nothing's as dangerous as the fuel you're soaking your torches in. Um, and I've heard that it hardens as it gets uh, hot, and that's why it's used. I've also made it without the Elmer's glue using the adhesive stuff from not Dubay. Was it Juggle Art? If you send me a message, Victoria, I'll send you a link. But I'm buying that just adhesive wicking that we all buy in the one-inch width or two-inch width, sticking it together, sewing it nicely with a – it's a hooked – I think it's a quilting needle to pierce through the Kevlar. Sew it together with mercerized cotton. Now, mercerized cotton, I do know, that's a process where you bake cotton above a chemical tray, and it makes the cotton harder to burn. And when it burns, it doesn't lose as much structural integrity but you still just really sew it. And you know this, you sew way more than anyone else I know. Really do like three times what you think would be the correct amount of mercerized cotton. Um, I'm going to cut this off for now, but feel free to pop more questions in. Maybe I'll build a torch live. That'd be kind of fun. I'll just build a, a fire eating torch and you guys can watch. Although I don't know. I mean, other than Victoria and I, this is useless information. If you just want to out of trivia, watch a fire eating circus freak, build a friggin' fire eater torch. Okay. I, you know, I am an entertainer. That is, that is my, my calling in life. As always, thank you guys for watching. I know for a lot of you, you're my friends and I directly ask you, I demand that you watch my Facebook live. If we're to remain friends, there's a reason for that. The more you watch me babble here while you're clearly not paying attention and watching something else on Netflix, the more people it shows it to. So thank you for doing that. If you're in Chicago, I'm rewriting my show. I would love to have an audience there to help me out. It is pay what you think it's worth as you leave, which means it's, it's $0 to a billion dollars. It literally fits any budget because you tell me what the budget is. If you're in Waukegan, do get tickets. Tickets for some reason today, I sold like 10, normally I sell two or three a day every day for the months before. So it says to me that some newspaper or radio talked about it when you suddenly see a 500% spike in sales, even if it's only two to 10, I ain't the Rolling Stones, but only got a hundred tickets a night to sell. So 10 a day is going to very quickly sell out for June 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. The 3rd, I wouldn't panic about. My Sundays never sell well. But June 1st and 2nd in Waukegan, if you want to go, please get your tickets in advance. I do hate when I beg people, beg people, beg people to buy tickets. And then I feel this weird guilt slash pride thing of like, I'm sorry I sold out. But I really am. Like, I'm happy. It's great. It's wonderful. There's that pride and ego. But man, I feel bad you didn't get to see the show because you didn't buy tickets early enough. So buy tickets early enough in Waukegan. Do not buy tickets for Chicago. There are none. Thank you for watching. I'm going to shut off Facebook and the Instagram. You get to stare at me awkwardly as I reach over my computer to find where the button is on the iPad. Good night.